comes around the same time every year. After the dog days of summer have passed and before the arrival of fall, a time that some look to with great enthusiasm, others with apprehension and dread. Three simple words, back to school. We are all a part of this yearly fall ritual from the parent who will be releasing their precious firstborn into the wild of schooling for the first time to the grandparent who has done their tours of duty and everyone in between. Friends, what if we exchange the sameness of this season for a fresh approach? Parents and homeschool parents, what if we approach this time of year with a fierce sense of intentionality? Intentionality in preparing our hearts and homes to be spaces and places where the grace of God can be on full display. Teachers, what if we looked at our classrooms as gardens ready for planting, watering, and harvesting the goodness of God in the lives of those placed in our care? Students, what if we approach this season as an opportunity instead of an obstacle? An opportunity to extend the love of God to our peers who desperately need to know that they are loved by the author of love. Church, what if we took this season as an opportunity to let the Spirit of God set our hearts ablaze so we can be the light of the world that we have been called to be? May our perspective be shifted from viewing this time as just another ending of summer, but instead fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our precious faith, striving by his power to live worthy of the call. Oh boy, it's back to school Sunday. Are you ready? Do you have all your books bought? You got all your pencils and uh, new clothes and taking a locker to school with you? Probably not, right? Uh, uh, I'm hoping maybe this represents both the beauty and the heaviness of all things education. I don't know about you guys. Oh, you know it's so great? Watch this. I was so trying to not kill myself that I literally put it upside down and I would have failed the first day of school. There we go. I like school, anybody else? I like to learn, I like to buy a bunch of books, but I heard a little hesitation in here, so I'm gonna be honest about life and the transitions of seasons. I also really like summer. I think I could spend every single day outside. I love sunshine, I love long summer months, and I love to goof off. So we're gonna do a vote in here. How many of you are glad that school is starting again? All the parents, exactly. All the parents. How many of you wish summer was eight months long and the school year was only four months long. None of you can afford to do that because you can't vacation that long, so it's okay. Uh, my wife likes to give me hints sometimes, and she said, you know, this crowd needs to know that you're more than just a pastor. You gotta tell some of your summer stories. So I have one summer story for you, and then we'll get to back to school Sunday. We'll get back to education. And this is the story that I want to tell you because it shows a little bit some of the things I enjoy doing, but it also shows you that I'm a knucklehead and I get in trouble a lot. So this summer, I got to work with a camp, a Christian retreat center up in Alaska, and I go up there and I uh, do a wide range of different things. I guess pastoral skills sometimes translate to Alaska, but one of the things that I get to do there that I love so much is I get to go fishing, and so... I was on this trip, and I was with this other person that's there at the camp, and caught a great fish, and they took a picture of me, and I'm like, I'm going to send this to my wife. And so I send this picture to my wife, and uh, right after that, the text message that I put was this, I really miss you, family, and my wife decided to text back, your face doesn't say that. <laughs> It looks like you're having the time of your life, and I am so glad that you are there. I love summer. I love being outside. I love being in God's creation, but I also, I do like to learn, and I do 
uh, like to teach, and I do like to see what happens when knowledge and information actually gets traded and shared and people become something different. And that's why we felt like today it was really important to pay attention to Back to School Sunday. How many of you are already starting to notice that um, the traffic patterns are changed? The lineups at school and everything else. How many have noticed that school's lunchables are disappearing? And if you go shopping somewhere to buy school supplies, it's chaos. Uh, I was probably uh, on the later side of things if I ever needed to help out and I'd show up. Have you ever gotten to the store shelf and everything is gone but the ugliest notebook you've ever seen and your kids like crying and not real happy? It, it is that time of year again. It is school time. It is fall. And in that, there's probably a wide range of different feelings. There are feelings of both excitement and dread. I was talking to somebody about their first grader who is very social and loves to be around people, but also really likes to be at home and likes to play. There's probably excitement and dread. But there's also anticipation and significant unknowns. I talked to some junior hires and high schoolers that were transitioning into a new school, and there's that it could be great, I hope it's great, but I don't know if it's going to be great. There's all those feelings involved. And what's fun about here at Hillside is we have almost everything under the sun represented at Hillside. Here's what I mean by that. Have you ever heard the word pedagogy before? I just love saying it. It just kind of rolls off my, my tongue. Pedagogy. Not pedigree, this is not about dogs, okay? Pedagogy is the philosophy or how you approach teaching that in our church what's represented is we have everything from public school educators to private school educators, Christian school educators. We have homeschool families. We have charter families. There are such a wide range of different ways that people are saying, God, help us figure this out. What I can't figure out with my Alaska example is why there isn't a school in the wild educator because I would try to fight for it, learn to fish, eat every day. But here's the deal with all of that. We're going to talk about is there anything that God would say to all of us regardless of what pedagogy, whatever style, whatever way that we navigate raising up the next generation and then even also paying attention to, do you realize every single one of us in here is a learner as well? You never grow out of that. You never turn this off. You never get to a point where you're like, I'm not a sponge anymore. Whatever happens, happens. We are all learners. In here today, I know this, we probably have preschoolers represented upstairs, kindergartners, elementary school upstairs, and in the room, we probably have junior hires, high schoolers, middle schoolers, we have trade school and military, college and university, grad school, doctoral, there are all kinds of possibilities for how we learn in this space. I added it up because I had to do this as well. I wasn't the sharpest tack in the drawer, and some of us need a lot longer uh, to learn, do you know in North America, if you decide to keep doing education all the way through higher ed, you could do 26 years of school at least? It's crazy. I saw an article that said the federal government kicked in $528 billion for all the states to figure out education. Like Christ followers should talk about this, care about this, or think about what would God want us to do with it. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to think through what would be God's perspective. But before I do that, I want to do one thing. I think in this room, we have all kinds of teachers. We have all kinds of mentors. We have all kinds of people that invest in others. And we also have all kinds of students. And so I pulled a couple books off my shelf to try to remember what a teacher and what a learner or a student is and what it would look like to kind of think through a perspective. Teachers from the book that Parker Palmer wrote, The Courage to Teach, said this, good teaching cannot be reduced to technique. Good teaching comes from the identity and the integrity of the teacher. Good teaching is a courageous act that results both from the teacher's intimate relation with the subject matter as well as the teacher's humility and openness to discover and learn. You know what's so great about that definition is that Parker Palmer pointed out that even the teacher is an ongoing learner with a humility 
probably realizing that there is one greater and one smarter and one wiser that actually needs to shape us, the teachers, before we ever teach. And then a view of the students. Hopefully all the educators in here feel this way, and on a really good day, all of us as parents feel this way about our kids. The students are the ones who we are hoping will know that they have value, that they have been created by God, and that they have something to contribute, and hoping that they can shape the world and not just be shaped by it. That was Gloria Durka, Durka in the book called The Calling of the Teacher. What's so fun about today is I'm hoping that with both of those definitions of both learner, student, and teacher, that we can come to God's word with a posture of, God, how would you have us look at this new season that stands in front of us? This is what I mean, everybody. We can buy all the books in the world. We can sign up for all the classes in the world. We can get all the degrees in the world. But the question really is this, what is our North Star? What actually brings meaning to it all? What holds it all together? How do we spend our time and energy? And so in this first kind of section of trying to think through how God's been challenging me, and I hope God's word will challenge you, is I want us to think through the posture and the focus of learning. Uh, I looked on my shelf this last week, and I came across a book that I haven't read for 20 years, and the title of it is a little bizarre, but hang in there. I'm sure it will make sense somewhere here in a little while. The title of the book is Eat This Book. I don't know how many of you have recently eaten a book. Maybe some of you that got in trouble and wrote a not nice note, and your teacher made you eat. Oh, yeah, that was education 30 years ago. Uh, but, but you probably haven't eaten a book recently, but I promise there's going to be a reason for that title and where we go with this. In that book, in the intro and in the preface, it postures and focuses on this particular Hebrew word called Hagah. I'll say it again so you can capture it and get it. The Hebrew word Hagah. And I want to say today it's going to be our posture for back to school and education. And so if you got your Bible, I'm going to show you a couple spots where this Hebrew word comes up and then we'll wrestle with it a little bit to see what it's about. If you got a Bible or a tablet, if you're with us online and you have the ability to look this up, turn to Psalm chapter 1. And in Psalm chapter 1, verse 2, let's see if you can discover where the word Hagah comes up and what its English translation is. It says this, Blessed is the man or woman whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. As you look at that verse, would you take a guess at which word is the Hagah? It's the word meditates. Look at another example, Psalm 63, look at verse 3. And if you want to, keep your fingers in that section because we'll come back to both of these. Psalm 63, 6 says this, when I, th uh, when I think upon you, and the you is God, so the psalmist is saying, hey God, when I think about you on my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, the word Hagah, once again, is in English translated meditate. It's interesting because I think our Hebrew ancestors, I call them ancestors, because if we are Christ followers or those that came before us, we have all the Old Testament scriptures, our ancestors put a focus on a particular posture, and the posture was this, meditate, think about, make sure that God's way is really central in how you navigate this world. And what I'm going to say today is really important for how we navigate back to school. There's another spot that this uh, Hebrew word comes up, and it's interesting because in the first two examples I gave you, those are more frequently used when someone is reading the type of writing that deals with the soul. You know, meditating is something not Eastern, but something that you're like, I'm trying to experience God, listen to God, ask God questions, read God's word, and then telling God, please help me interpret. That meditation is like a deep, deep soul work that is getting ready for God to shape everything. But there's a spot in the Old Testament 
where the word haga comes up again. But in this particular moment, it's a word that goes even like probably with a little bit different description that forces us to take everything and anything and wrestle with it in a way that's even greater than just meditating. And it's found in Isaiah chapter 31, verse 4, in that book called Eat This Book. The author pointed out that in this particular Isaiah passage, there's another understanding. Verse 4 says this, as a lion or a young lion growls over its prey. That word growls is actually the same word as meditate. It's that Hebrew word hagar. The Hebrew word hagar is a verb. It's to, cry, to, to growl, to muse, to mutter, to meditate, to devise, to plot, to imagine, to utter, or to speak. Does anybody here happen to own a lion or a tiger at their particular house where I could come observe and watch how this is done? Okay, second best. Does anybody have a dog? I got two labs at my house. One's ours, one's my daughter, and we do lots of grand dog sitting, it seems like, right? When I watch my dogs, I think I understand this growl word a little bit more. How many of you ever order a box and for some reason the dogs seem to know when that box is delivered, whatever is in that box is for them? I'm like, can you read? How do you know that what's in here is for you? You open up the box and they're just panting and the tail's wagging and inside there you pull out some stuffed toy that's like $3 and you're hoping it will last three weeks and it doesn't even last three minutes. I pull out that toy and our labs will look at us and they're just waiting. I mean, they're just so focused. Nothing else matters but this toy. And I'll squeeze it for a second. It does a little squeaky noise and their eyes get even bigger. And then I throw it down the hallway and they run down the hall. I'm like, great, they're going to be busy forever. And within about oh, 30 seconds, they already have their paws on it. It's pinned down and they're ripping it violently apart. And I'm like, wait, you're the sweetest, most beautiful dog in the world. This is too aggressive for me. And stuffing is flying everywhere. But I got to mimic for a second how they prowl, how they go after it. You guys ever see like on any of the Explorer, or any of the, the outdoor channels when they show foxes and how foxes just like slowly creep up? And then they kind of get down in their little, like, like this, and then all of a sudden it's like, spring right on top of that bad boy, right? My dogs do that every single time. And when I read this scripture and thought about this Hagar word and this meditate, saw just all of a sudden I'm trying to imagine my own body posture, my own commitment, my own understanding for how often do I prowl, growl, wrestle for everything that God wants to do something and shape something in me. As I think about going back to school, I could easily say, students, make sure you jump through all the hoops of education. Make sure you figure out your calling and vocation. Make sure that what you do, you get all the A's and make sure you do it. Do you realize the posture I'm trying to encourage here in scripture is this? In whatever you do, whatever you're studying, whatever space you find yourself, Hagar, wrestle with, prowl, think about what God is up to and how does any of that translate into the ways of God? Or sometimes even, how do we know what's truth and what's not truth? Okay, can I go a little bit deeper on some of this Hagar business? Because it just, it's powerful metaphor. I mentioned the other metaphor of eat this book. I've never eaten a book before. I don't want to eat a book. But three times in scripture, the phrase eat this book comes up. I want to read one of them for you. It's found in Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 3. It says, Then he said to me, Son of man, eat this scroll I'm giving you and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it, and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. Let me give you a little background. Ezekiel was a prophet in the Old Testament. And let me tell you where Ezekiel lived. Ezekiel lived in Babylon, not Israel. Israel had been taken over by the Babylonians and they had grabbed all the smart ones and hauled them off into exile. And in some ways, imagine Ezekiel in the most, what would feel like not home, oppressive. They're feeding him all this information and things about how Babylon does stuff. 
And Ezekiel has a vision. And all three of these visions that I'm going to read, they were either visited by an angel of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord, or God himself. And basically they would hear these words of eat this book. And the book or the scriptures that was described was for Ezekiel in a foreign land in exile, basically saying, if you want real truth, make sure everything you swallow is based on this. There's another really sweet one in Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16. It says this, when your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight. For I bear your name, Lord God Almighty. By the way, church can be really weird sometimes. I'm basically telling you to eat the book. But here's the metaphor that I'm giving you. God's way is the way that brings both joy and heart's delight. Jeremiah was also in a spot where Israel had been run over, conquered. And while Ezekiel had been pulled away into exile in Babylon, Jeremiah was walking around in the cities with all the destruction and everything else. And as Jeremiah kept talking about God's way, do you know Jeremiah was ridiculed, made fun of, and treated horribly? But he kept running back to where the truth was, which was his delight and his joy. One more New Testament example of eat this book is in Revelation chapter 10, verse 9. It says, so I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. My wife says something, and then she prays a lot. She's really convictional about our schools and our education, and we have nieces and nephews, even though our kids are out of school, that are in school. And my wife says this often before we pray for schools or education. She goes, I'm so sad that wrong is being promoted as right sometimes, and wrong and right is being looked down as wrong sometimes. The, the reason we need to eat this book, the reason that we need to meditate, growl, and wrestle is we need to have such an active posture and perspective that we are ready for truth that is absolutely going to bring us into right relationship with God and not just keep swallowing and scooping up every message that everybody gives us all the time. Here's probably the best way I would sum this up. Hey, church, eat this book, devour God's word, ingest God's way. It changes everything. Yeah, go to school. You have to. Get degrees. They make a difference. There's skills and there's things that we can learn. But as you're doing it, who's the one who's ultimately setting your North Star trajectory of what truth in life is all about? I love God's word because it really gets us thinking about a steady diet of devouring things that are full of hope, full of truth, full of joy, and bring us to a space that changes everything. Let me give you some practicals on this kind of first one of what our posture is. Uh, I, again, I'm sorry, she doesn't pay me, but I'm just so impressed by her. I got to give you more examples of what I watched my wife do over the years. If you have young family, or if you're a grandparent, or if you're an auntie or uncle that's helping out and dropping kids off at school, or if you're doing homeschool, whatever context or pedagogy you're a part of, I want us as a church to be ready for every opportunity like a dog that's ready to pounce on something. Do you realize the seven minutes it takes to drop a couple kids off at school if they're in public, private, or Christian schools? And the seven minutes when you have their full attention before they get out of the car, run in, eat a snack, and start playing things are the two most powerful seven-minute bookend moments ever. And if you're like me when I was a parent still trying to spread peanut butter on a piece of bread while getting into the car to go drop my kids off at work and then begging the kids, don't tell mom how bad I did today getting you ready. Uh, if I show up fully present when my kids were young and start the morning with, hey, what do you guys have ahead of you today? Remember, God totally goes before us and God will totally help you with everything. Can I pray for you? Could you imagine the last thing our kids hear whether they're young or old, or even if they're headed off to college or trade school, even praying in a hallway, 
is my God is for me, my God is with me, and my God is ready to navigate the day with me. Can you imagine when they get home or in their car on the way home and they talk about a friend that was mean or a teacher that picked on them? By the way, teachers don't pick on them, just kids feel that way sometimes. Or if they heard something, they're like, I'm not sure if this is true. We were taught this today. Could you see how sweet of a moment that would be to go, hey, what do you think God says about that? Let's talk about that a little bit. We get to be a part of this devouring, this meditating, this focusing in on what God wants to do. Church, I got some statements I would love to put your direction, and I hope you will wrestle with them, that you will pray about them, and that you investigate how this works for your context of learning and teaching, whether you're a teacher or a student, or you're raising young ones or old ones that are trying to learn. These are the statements I've been praying for you this week, and here's what's really fun. Our prayer team has been praying for you. Our staff has been praying for you. In our Wednesday morning prayer, we prayed for teaching and education of every kind. We prayed for specific names of students that were going to school. And I would say these statements summarize what we are hoping for our church and for God's church around the world. I want godly wisdom, not just wisdom. Am I the only one? I want godly perspective and not just perspective or skills. I want godly character and not just some watered down character. I want godly direction and not just general direction. And church, that is not going to happen unless you and I devour, chase after, do it with our families, do it with each other. Uh, This is a shameless plug right here because we are in the middle of signing up for all of our fall opportunities. And kind of what I would love to say in here, every single one in here who is thinking and breathing right now is a learner, is a student. Remember the statement I said earlier? You have value. God has something for you. And God wants to keep changing and transforming so that you can shape the world rather than having the world shape you. Do you realize this fall, as we think about what we're going to sign up or put our time and our energy to, a rooted group or a uh, discussion guide that goes over the sermon with other Christ followers as we sharpen one another can change everything. I, I love this thing called education, but man, I want a whole lot of God in my education because I cannot do it without God. I have been in secular settings, private settings, Christian settings, and I have found in all three of those, I need a discernment that helps me know what is of God and how do I receive it and how do I let go of the other things. It's really fun. I mentioned that camp to you earlier. And in that camp, uh, they had the week before I got there, they had uh, young people whose uh, uh, parents uh, were either law enforcement or military And uh, they had lost uh, one of their parents, either in the line of duty or because of some other horrific circumstance. And this camp had basically gotten other people in that particular uh, kind of military unit or in that police department that were willing to be godly uncles to pour into them. They showed up to this camp and they did all the wild, fun, crazy things that you can imagine. They taught them how to fish. They taught them how to light a fire. They taught them how to set up a tent, how to play uh, uh, softball next to a river. And when the home run went into the river, somebody had to go swim after it. I mean, I can name fun thing after fun thing. But when I showed up the week later, the thing I heard the most about was the godly training for an hour and a half each day where the students were sitting with another godly teacher, mentor, adopted uncle, and they were learning the ways of God. I love a fun summer, but I want a God-filled summer, not just a, a, a fun summer. I love education, but I want a God-filled education, and it can happen in any of the settings that I've mentioned, but it requires people like us to make sure that God is in and a part of the conversation. I got one more section that I want to read to you out of Scripture, but before I do that, can I just tell you what the rest of Psalm 1 says? In Psalm 1, I highlighted that there was a meditating on God's word. Psalm 1, verse 2. Listen to verse 3. For those that meditate on God, that person is like a tree planted by 
streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. I don't know if you noticed this. It didn't say in there, and if you get straight A's, and if you jump through all the hoops, and if you have a wall full of degrees, you will prosper. No, it says the one that's rooted in God prospers. Listen to this other sweet uh, Psalm 63 that I read to you earlier. Verse 6 was, on my bed, I meditate and remember you, God. You know what verse 7 says? Because you are my help. I sing and I sit in the shadow of your wings. Here's the best thing that I could give you on a back to school Sunday is God. I don't have all the answers for how to educate, what's best for each individual kid, each student, but we do share in unity the living God that wants us to have a full life. I want to read a sweet passage out of Matthew chapter 13, and it's very challenging. Some of you remember a couple months ago that I uh, read the parable of the sower. This isn't that one, but this is another farming parable, and it does have seeds in it. Listen to this and think about the context of education wherever you're at in that journey, whether you're just a learner or you're in school or you're trying to help young ones in school. Matthew 13, verses 24 through 30 says this. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servant came to him and said, Sir, don't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servant asked, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, answer, No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Don't you love church? We get, to, we get to talk about eating books and then about weeds and burning things. I mean, it's, uh, this is education in the wild right here. Here's what I love to say about parables. You have to be so careful not to over-interpret them, but we also have to be really careful not to under-interpret them. Here's something really interesting that I felt like this week was kind of my second point I wanted you to walk away. We talked about the posture of getting ready for education is being ready to meditate and know God and keep God in the conversation. Here's the second one. I think we need to also be aware and cautious that even God's word tells us there are weeds in the fields you and I live in and do life. If any of us think there is a bubble wrap scenario where we can all hide and have life be perfect and there's nothing but truth, please come tell me because I haven't been able to find it and I want to go there. What is so powerful about this parable is it talks about the weeds. And the word that's translated weeds in this passage is actually the specific plant called darnel. It has been called wheat's evil twin. Because as it grows, it looks almost exactly like wheat, but its seeds can make you dizzy, off balance, and nauseous. Throughout human history, Carla Harding says, she was on a podcast on Monday where they read this passage, says, Darnell has been both a menace and a intoxicant. Small doses can give you a high, but large doses can be fatal. Thankfully, the servants in this story can tell the difference between the growth of God's kingdom and the alluring substitutes that are ultimately harmful. Here's the caution and the reality that I would love to give us as a church. There are weeds in the fields we all live in. And this passage is reminding us, don't worry, trust God, stay faithful, 
In the end, it will all be made right. But in the meantime, you better stay meditating, growling, wrestling, chasing after, eating the book, because God's way is the thing that's going to keep us on track. I, I don't know what to tell everybody because I didn't do it well when I worked at a university for 15 years. I would have high school parents that were coming to visit and figure out where they and their uh, young ones, their adults that they were going to send to college should go. And they would often say to me, I got younger kids. What would you recommend as the best education for them? Is it private school, Christian school, public school, home school, charter school? What's the best way to do it? And I literally finally got to the point that I said, you need this and you probably need to be praying about this every year and you probably need to be looking at each kid individually and different because this journey of making sure that the next generation knows God is a wrestling match that deserves our full attention and full dependence upon God. Wherever we're doing education, may we as a church be united to pray for, cheer for, and watch out for one another. Here's probably one of the funnest things I'd love to give you as a recommendation for how you trust and depend and you're patient on God is prayer. My wife, again, the example that I love to point to, just had this feeling when our kids were in school to go, where are the other Christians? They may not go to our church. They may be in a different denomination. They might have a little different way that their services would be, but we all are trying to be hungry and meditate and growl after this God. And she would rally that crowd and basically say, hey, one day a week, let's just meet after we drop our kids off and walk around the school. Not like Jericho, not like they were protesting, But walk around the school and pray for the administrators, the teachers, the students. God, would you have your way in this school? I know homeschool crowds where parents will have a list of prayer requests and they're praying for each of the parents who are trying to tutor and teach and have that space for learning. Charter schools that are trying to chase after God. Church, I think the greatest thing you and I can do is speak truth and help our young ones know where God is at work and what God's up to. But we have to remember there are weeds everywhere. There is no bubble wrap moments or spaces. But God, our God is faithful and in the end it will be separated and he can Watch out for us in the meantime if we stay connected this way. By the way, this is supposed to be a hopeful message. Even if you're like going, why in the world are we eating books and watching out for weeds? Because our God is so good and knows what we need to be thoughtful of and navigate in this world. Uh, Last year was really special. Uh, Our communication department put together a really amazing set of prayers They were prayers for back to school. They were prayers for administrators. They were prayers for students, of prayers for teachers. And in this space, I know we have teachers of all kind from, uh, we have professors, we have homeschool moms and dads that find themselves now trying to figure out common core. Good luck, I'm glad my kids are older. Uh, and, And you need God's help. If you go online, we have a QR code where you can basically Have these prayers as a part of your life. If you're a grandparent, an aunt or uncle or anybody, I think our whole church should be praying. It's what we're called to as the people of God, and God can work in all the spaces I've mentioned today. Uh, Natalie Moore, our high school uh, ministry director, is going to join me with uh, a couple educators here. And uh, in the process of preparing for this, Uh, I had this grandiose idea, and I wanted one representative for every educational setting ever, and I think that ended up being like 26 different people. If I do private school, public school, home school, charter school, and then I do every age level, and I finally went, okay, I'm not going to be able to do that, but maybe I could get three that would represent and help share from their heart a prayer request that we could all pray for. That today, I want to just start our back to school. And by the way, I'm going to give you a new title for this morning. Our Back to God Sunday. Not just back to school, but back to God Sunday. That I wanted to pray for our educators today. And then we're going to pray for students second. But here's what I want to get a view of first. How many of you are retired teachers, administrators, or any type of support system in education, facilities, teacher's aid, any of those? Would you stand for a second? 
I want to see who you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here's why we're doing this. Wait a second. Stay standing for a second. Stay standing for a second. I love this connecting moment in church. This crowd has already been on the journey and the road that many of you are just now experiencing. They are sisters and brothers in Christ. Meet them, ask them for help, and maybe even see if they'd be praying for you. Those of you who have done education, thank you very much. You could be seated. Natalie. Hello. 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 Um, if I have not had the opportunity to meet you yet, my name is Natalie. I'm our high school ministry director and I'm super excited to be up here today with these three incredible humans who uh, are educators in our Hillside community and, and get to serve in different spaces throughout our community in different ways and different shapes and different forms. And so today we get to hear from them a little bit about what they're praying for as they head into this new school year. And our prayer is that their prayers would be representative of many of you in this room who hold space as educators in our community. And so um, I'm going to introduce them to you. They're going to share their prayer requests and and we'll be able to spend some time praying for our educators as a whole, as a community. So we'll start right here with my dear friend, Tina. Tina is a parent, and she also is a homeschool teacher. So Tina, we'd love for you to share with us your prayer request. Okay. My prayer. My prayer for those of you homeschooling is that you would keep your eyes on your Heavenly Father, the one who has called you to this path, knowing he has equipped you and will provide for you the strength, encouragement, and wisdom needed to run this homeschooling journey well. Amen. Thanks, Tina. Yeah. Next, we have Al. Al is a parent also and an elementary and middle school music teacher in a, in a public school space. So Al, share with us your prayer request. All right, so my prayer request was, would be uh, that God would help us as teachers be salt and light to our students and other staff members who desperately need Jesus but don't realize it. Amen. Awesome. And last but not least, we have Jordan. Jordan is a parent as well and also an assistant principal in our Etiwanda School District. So we'd love to know what you are praying for as you head into this school year, Jordan. So as administrators, we have courageous conversations on a daily basis, whether that's with students, parents, your staff members, your colleagues. And I think this year is especially important to have those courageous conversations with ourselves to remind us that we are bold in Christ and we are shining his light in the public space. Mm, thank you so much. Oh, man. I know for each of you, those are powerful prayer requests that you all shared. And um, like I already said, I hope that they're representative of many prayers for all of our educators as you head into a new school year. And so we're going to get to spend some time praying for those um, now. But first... And I'm going to kind of guide us and get us ready for that. If you are a teacher or ed educator in any setting, I mean, we have... Just right down the street here at Chafee, every time I drive by it, I pray for a couple of people that I know are working and teaching there. We have seminary professors. We have grade school, grammar school, elementary school, high school. If you are an educator of any kind, if you are the educator in your home with homeschool, will you stand? Anybody, everybody. Come on. I know. You're all, I, maybe I should have said like this. If there's anybody in here that knows they need God's help that's in the education arena, would you stand? All of a sudden, everybody stands up, right? If you work to support any of that, if you are in facilities or any of uh, the, the different systems that happen, administration, principals, vice principals, even if you're somebody that goes to Sacramento and lobby and try to do that, will you stand as well? And as that crowd is standing... If you are an auntie and uncle, a parent or a grandparent, if any of you will ever do homework for even five seconds or ask a great godly question, will you also stand? Come on. There we go. It should be almost the entire room. And we have a tradition here. We like to extend hands. Those of you that said you were retired, right now is a great opportunity for you to stand and go pray with somebody. But will you either do this, extend your hands up this way to pray for this crowd as they live into the prayer requests that they had or extend a hand to somebody standing around you. And Natalie is gonna pray for our educators here. God, how incredible it is to see a visual representation of the people pouring into this next generation of students. 
God, I pray over each of these teachers, parents, administrators, employees, um, God, that your name would be made great in the way that they love and do their work this school year, God. Would you empower them with everything they need to do the roles that you've called them to? Would you give them strength and wisdom and peace? And God, would you give them um, voices to boldly speak your love and your truth into our community who desperately needs to hear it? We love you. We thank you for this opportunity to lift these people up to you this morning. And we ask all this in your name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks for praying, Natalie. All right. If you are a student of any kind, a learner that's in formal education, whether young or all the way through doctoral work or trade school, if you are a student, will you please stand? And by the way, I got a whole crowd of students right back here, college students, university students. If you are a student, would we give them a hand, all right? We are gonna pray for you. We are gonna support you. On this Back to God Sunday, we're going to make sure that this is important, all right? But as you look around and you see this crowd that we're going to pray for, by the way, you guys look sharp up there. As we pray for this crowd, I actually want to challenge our thinking at Hillside. If this works for you even a little bit, that means we're all learners. Natalie, I want to pray for everybody and not just our students because Hillside wants to grow into the ways God wants us to learn. And so if you are willing to admit and confess you are a learner and you know you need God's help, will you actually stand in partnership with these students because we are all still learning. If you are a learner, I want to pray for you too. God, I pray right now for the students of this room. That's what a disciple is. A disciple is a follower, a learner. And so, Lord, uh, first we pray for those students that are in formal education, all grade levels, all levels, all those little ones upstairs. God, we pray that we would find ways to posture ourselves, to meditate, to chase after, to ingest you the most so that we don't just go the ways of the world. God, we want truth to be truth, and we don't want uh, other things to be completely in the way. We want godly character. We want godly wisdom. And so, God, we pray for all these students from doctoral to all kinds of trade school to all the way to kindergarten and preschool, God. And then, God, I pray for the rest of this room. We are disciples. We are followers. I pray for Hillside Church as we enter in this fall would we all be learners and take the steps to keep growing in you? I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.